Did any of you guys have uh, anything that you worked on or planned yesterday on the hottest day of the year? How much regret was there in you for doing so? Yeah? <laughs> the ones with your eyes drooping down, we know who you are. What were you doing outside yesterday? Crazy, crazy warm. Okay, well, um, I don't think there's really much in the way that I need to do as far as... Um, as announcements and we're getting started a little late so let's jump on in to John chapter 14 and if you could bring this down just a little bit Chad please I think I'm a little bit noisy okay um, chapter 14 we uh, we left off last week at verse 18 and we'll uh, we'll take on verses 19 to 24 but I have something a little unusual that I'd like to do uh, as we start this morning and it, it seems interesting that the, something was brought to my attention this week. It was an article that was written and uh, it, it's interesting the timing because of where our text leads us this morning. So uh, what I'd like to do is we'll read it together and uh, I want to read a, an article that was brought to my attention. I won't mention who it was that wrote it. I don't think that frankly they deserve the attention and what they had said it, to me is absurd but I thought you might find it interesting and important because it speaks for a large portion of the church and it goes to the heart of why we do what we do around here. So with all of that kind of cryptic information that I just gave you, let's pray and I'll explain all of that, okay? Father, we thank you for gathering us here this morning and we are so grateful that we are able to come to your word. You speak to us through it and so we are reading the words said by Jesus to the disciples and they have come to us through the ages that we may know, that we may understand, that we may learn and grow. So we thank you for this time in your word and we thank you for your Holy Spirit who has promised to us in these verses that he would lead us in all truth. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember what we saw last week at verse 18, and it says, And I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. Now this was in the, in the context, it is the promise of the sending of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling them that he's there for a short time, and he's going to reemphasize that in our text this morning. He's doing what he can to prepare them for that eventuality. What is going to happen in his absence? Will they have to just wander around and not know what's coming next? In fact, he's taken a great deal of time to explain to them what's coming next, but once again he has already said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Or actually, I will pray and the Father will send him. And so this is continuing on with that. Remember, what we are reading here is a running dialogue. Now, just in chapter 14 alone, we are going to get to the third time when he's asked to clarify something that he has just said. We're going to get the third of those. The first one came by Thomas, the second one by Philip, and we'll look at those. This time it is Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, and he asks the question. Now, interesting, and, and you know, sometimes you're saying, would you just stop interrupting him? He's, he's on a, you know, there's a, a flow to this, and he's explaining a lot of things. Me, personally, I'm grateful for the interruptions because it brings a great deal of clarification. We'll see that here in just a moment. But when Jesus says that he will send the Holy Spirit, not leaving us as orphans, he's going to continue on in that understanding, because we read in verse 19, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And why is that? Well, because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them... It is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, if you read it quickly, sometimes it can run on. The words can run on to one another. But what he is saying here is unique in all of the, the religions of the world. And if you've noticed, I've been saying that a lot over these last few weeks. But there is something that is told to us by Jesus the Son, who was sent by God the Father, to minister to people and to make God known to them in a way that it had never happened before. 
Because, yeah, the God of the Old Testament was very much involved with his creation, which is, again, unique in that they knew him, he spoke to them, he communicated directly to them, he raised up people to be his voice, he's done all such things. But now in Jesus, there was a physical representation of God right in front of them. And he had said, everything that you're hearing from me, just know that I'm not doing these things of my own will, but I'm here to do what the Father had sent me. Even the words that I speak are from him. And so this relationship that is, is spoken of here, once again, is unique. Now, I know it's become a sticker and a slogan and a cliche, but when it says that Christians have a relationship with God... Yeah, that sounds like some kind of a modern construct, okay? That's we're trying to explain something to people in a way that differentiates what they think about Christianity versus the, the reality of it. And so the cliche was, well, we don't have a religion, we have a relationship. Because it's become so cliched, we might forget that that is exactly what Jesus is teaching here. He is teaching relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, personal. And he says that the world doesn't have it. So when people would come to us and say all roads lead to the same place or, or you know, all roads lead to God or there's really no difference and they try to homogenize this concept of God to all of the different religions, it doesn't fit. Right here Jesus says there is definitely a dividing line. Verse 19 tells that. There is you and there is the world. There's a difference between those two things. Now, in our text this morning, you're going to notice that he talks about the keeping of his words. There's a hearing part of it. There's an understanding and a coming to a knowledge of these things. But then there is also the obedience to what it is that we've heard. And so oftentimes we will hear people quote the Bible usually to defend themselves. And yet they don't believe what's put in there. Isn't that funny? Some of the, the most scholarly people are the ones who don't agree with the Bible. They know the parts of it that they can quote back to you to get you off their back but they don't know enough about the rest of the scripture that they could come to a knowledge of it. So it brings me to this interesting article. And it was in a Christian publication, and they, they put up their little caveat about, you know, trying to play both sides. Well, we don't know that we necessarily agree with all of this. It may be a little offensive to what you're reading, but it's a discussion that we should have. That's not a discussion that we should have unless we're going to dismiss the thought altogether. But they put it out there as food for thought. And the title of this article was The Ridiculous Emphasis Christians Place on the Bible. Yeah. So I have heard it said, not of just this church, but of churches like us, like Calvary Chapels and other ones who believe that we should be reading through and studying the entirety of the scripture. And that it will take our entire lives as believers to just grasp the most elementary bits of our faith because God is so grand, God is so great above our understanding, how can we ever really come to a full understanding of everything that he would teach us? So he goes on and he says, I bring all of this up to make one simple point. The modern day church places a ridiculous amount of emphasis on studying the Bible. And then he gives us a few examples here and he says, most Christians today assume that to be Christian means to have a personal relationship with the Bible instead of the risen Jesus. As though it's an either or. How do you know anything about the risen Jesus unless you know about his word? You can't just have a few little things thrown out here and there anecdotally and come to come some kind of an understanding of the nature of God and your relationship to him. But this either or is an infesting of the church. Listen to some of these questions. These are things that people are, as he puts, to be consumed with the Bible, to obsess over its details, to memorize curiously meaningless trivia about it. I'm trying to figure out where the meaningless trivia is found in the Bible because I've not yet found it. So he says, or then to study its root words and the historical data underpinning every sentence, every chapter, and every book. And I went to look at this and he boasted that he now has a couple thousand people in his church, but in their small groups, they have one small group dedicated just to playing Texas Hold'em. So I'm wondering, since there is not an emphasis on the studying of the Bible, well then tell me what it is that the church should be doing. When we meet together, should we not make the Bible and the understanding of its truths the essential primary part of why we gather? 
Because right here, Jesus' own words, trust me, I am not using this as some kind of a springboard. I'm just saying, look at the absurdity that we see relative to what Jesus says here. So let's go back and take a look at it. Verse 19 tells us, first of our verses this morning, he says, A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. It's a statement. It's a straight up, one of a kind type of a thing. Here, it's going to happen. Now, as he says this, they're mere hours away from this being a reality. Now, we do know that after he resurrects, he will have a few moments or a few times when they will see him in the very physical sense. But he is speaking of the physical sense will, in an ongoing way, that the world will not see him. These guys will get a glimpse of him on a couple of occasions after this, but in the very physical sense, he will be gone from them, Jesus, the one that they knew, the person, the physical person. However, look at what he says. He says, the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Why? Because I live, you will live also. Again, another complete statement. Not ambiguous, it is straightforward, and it's not open to any kind of interpretation. And notice that he, he raises a very clear distinction between the two. There is you who will see me. There is the world who will not. And so for all those people that would say all roads lead to God and there's really only the variations between the religions of their own concept, but it's the same God. Hardly. The God of the Bible reveal, reveals himself as deeply personal and also distinctly separate from the world and calls his believers to be alike. Now, when he goes on, he gives further definition to this. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father and in and you in me, and I in you. This is speaking about relationship. So once again, for those people who say, we don't have a religion, we have a relationship, there is a real truth to that. I almost kind of want to find a way to get away from the cliche, because most people just tune out when they hear that. But for Jesus to say, there is already the relationship that he has with the Father. It's the Father and a Son, and the Father has sent his Son, that he might be able to secure this idea of relationship. This also, you see in verse 19, twice you see the word see. Let's read it. A little while longer and the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Now, we understand those kind of in a different way because the, the world understands, as they have been contesting with him, there's that physical person. They would know as soon as they saw him, they would see Jesus. They would know that that's him, Jesus from Galilee. He's got the disciples. He's the one that's always getting the Pharisees upset. We know him right? But he talks to them in a different way because we can say we see him, though not in the physical sense, but we see him because of our understanding in the spiritual, in the mind, in the heart, in the soul, right? So there are times when, when somebody's trying to explain something to you and you finally get to that point and you go, oh, I see. Well, you didn't see it because it's visible. You, you realized it. You saw it because of concept, because of understanding. And so he says to these disciples, the world will not see me physically, but you will not only see him physically again, because he's talking to the disciples and he appears to all of them, but you're really going to have your eyes open. You will definitely see and understand and behold. Okay? So he moves on from that, this idea of relationship, and we'll get back to that. And then it says in verse 21, Now, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me, and, um, yeah, yeah, he, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and then I will manifest myself to him. Now, this idea of manifesting, interesting word. We probably don't use it all that often. I think we pretty much understand what it means. But he's going to appear to them in, in that sense, that he's going to make himself known. We'll look at that in just a moment. But he makes this statement, and then it is followed by what is a question. We see it in verse 22. Now Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Now Jesus is going to answer that question. Now there have been all these other questions before this time. There are two others, I should say. And there is the one that Philip asks, and it is, um, I'm sorry, uh, that Thomas asks, found at the beginning of this chapter. And it led us to the I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the sixth of the seven I am statements. Let's look at it. In chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, 
and even into 3, you see Jesus makes these statements. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Philip asks the question. I'm sorry, Thomas asks the question. He says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And so Jesus answers the question, a valid question. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Great. Are you not, I hope you are, are you not, though, glad that he asked the question? Because it led to Jesus giving the answer that he gives, which opens up so much of how do you actually find the depths of understanding just that one verse. You can spend the rest of your Christian life understanding what it is for Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life, that no one could come to the Father except through him. So for that idea that Bible study is not important, if you don't study the Bible, even just that verse, which could take you the rest of your life to fully grasp or to grasp in some extent, you're really missing the point. Look at the second of these. Jesus says, now, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Remember when we studied that? Jesus is saying, though you've been with me all of this time, there still is some kind of doubt, because if you had known me, which means, by implication, you're still not fully understanding, guys, but he is also, in the same way, as he goes on in this chapter, is saying, there's going to be a time when you will understand. And when will that be? Well, when they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And then a lot of things are going to become very, very clear to them. Well, so, he says, If you had known me, you would have my, known my Father also. From now on, you know him and you have seen him. So then Philip asks him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough. It will be sufficient. And so what does Jesus say to him? Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me, uh, has seen me, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how is it that you can say, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen him. That's the answer. Now in this case, Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to manifest myself to him. So verse 21. This is meaning that you have, that you have possessed of mind, uh, this understanding. If you have these two words that are here, he who has my commandments and keeps. Very important parts. Now, again, think of commandments. Commandments are not necessarily what we're thinking. Teachings is a better way of understanding. There is the part of it that gets it, understands it intellectually, maybe even spiritually, but it's an entirely different thing to be obedient to such things. So, again, with in my mind, thinking a bit about this article that I just read a little bit about, let me give you some examples of this. The idea of Jesus' teachings not just to understand them in their content, but then to live them out. In John's Gospel alone, you have the seven I am statements. The first one's found in chapter 6, where Jesus talks about being the bread of life. And this idea that if you don't eat the flesh and drink the blood, then there's no life in you. He said a bunch of things about that that flipped everybody out. And the reason was, his point was, the partaking of him or being a part of him, that without that, there is no life. So I would ask the question, how much study does it take to get to the, the basic understanding of that, but then to understand it in its depth? And yet Jesus has said to us, that idea of partaking, to me, communion, as we partake of the body and the blood, in a symbolic way, is an identifying with that. His life, his death, his resurrection, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood. Think of the implication of all of that in a very simple statement. And that's just one of the things that he had taught. Commandments, if you will, but those things that he taught. where He, he makes absolute statements. How about chapter 8, where he talks about being the light of the world? That a person, if they have that light, will not walk in darkness. Now, how much of the rest of your life could be dedicated to understanding what it is that Jesus has opened your eyes to? Things that you now know that you did not know before him. Or you go on to chapter 10 where he talks about being the door to the sheep, that they come in to that, that place of safekeeping. Or they are led out and brought to pasture. 
Because then he goes on to call himself the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. And when he speaks, they hear him because they know his voice and he knows them and they know him. How much of the rest of your life could be spent fully understanding that because it should be every day of your life you live in that reality. Your good shepherd leads you out and brings you back in and sees to your safekeeping because he illuminates to your eyes and your understanding everything that there is because he is the bread of life who gave himself that we would not hunger or thirst. Or how about him being the resurrection and the life in chapter 11? That he would have to die and resurrect and that even if a person dies, they will also live to the ones that believe. Now, again, how much study does it take to get to the even most elementary parts of that? Or what we're reading right here, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Or in the next chapter, chapter 15, where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. That is a pick up on chapter 14, where he talks about this abiding and this manifesting and all of those kind of things. He makes it even a step further by saying, without me you can do nothing. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Talk about relationship. So again, I, I, I pose the question to you because I think it is hugely important. The idea of studying to know and to understand, to learn and then to apply what is found in God's word will be a lifelong pursuit. And even if you pursue daily, you'll never come to the full extent of understanding. Because some of this is so grand that the mind can't comprehend it. And yet he asks us to come to him that we may learn, that we may know. So again, chapter 14, verse 21. The person who has, that's possessing of mind, of heart, it's the inner man kind of thing, that has my commandments and then keeps them, is to tend or to guard them with vigilance. When you read Psalm 119, verse 11, and Psalm 119 is an ode to the word of God by David, one who did not have the spirit dwelling in him, but his love for the word of God was immense. And consider how much of it was written that he had. How much of it was going to be written. Most of, or much more of the Bible was written after his time than before his. So consider that he was able to say, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119 verse 11. If that was the pursuit of the king of Israel, should that not also be the pursuit of every believer from that time on, because here we have the teachings of Jesus, the Son sent by the Father who was manifest or shown to us, who says to seek him out. You'll see me. I will reveal myself. Manifest. Show openly. Right? So, we read on. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. Manifesting. So that's when Judas is able to say, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us? This is, of course, easy for us to understand because we have the hindsight and we have the Holy Spirit. He's asking a question that will not fully be realized until the Lord not only resurrects, ascends, sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit indwells this man who asks this question. And once that happens, a lot is going to become very, very clear. Now, let me pause for just a moment. It is easy for us to forget. If you are a believer in here today, from the moment that you came into a relationship with Jesus, you acknowledged your need for him, confessed your sin, asked him to forgive, that moment, whenever it was that you could say, I was born again, you just must know that there is a regeneration on a spiritual level. You've been restored to something that had not uh, previously existed, no matter how good your intellect was, no matter how much of the Bible you may have known or quoted, until you were forgiven of your sins and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you didn't know half of it. So, when that time comes, that is the manifesting that is being spoken of here. And it's quite interesting when you see Jesus' answer. Take a look at it. In verse 23, so Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's important. And of course, it begs the question, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I will ask you to examine your own life. And I'm going to say or ask you the question, do you love God? 
Do you love Jesus? Because he's the one speaking here. Do you love him? Now, he also tells you that if you love me, you're going to love the Father. There is this relationship that goes in all these different directions. The Father loves us. The Son loves us. Because of that, we love him in reply because of all of what he's done for us. Okay, that's just very elementary. But if we take a look at this and he says, if you love me, then you are going to be obedient to my word. So do your actions actually follow your profession of your mouth? I love Jesus. I love the Lord. I love God. I love what he's done for me. Great. Then is it shown by how you live your life? Because that's seen as an evidence here. And it is not that you work your way to heaven. It is that the works follow this work of God in your life. It's what Paul talks about, where he says that it's not of works because we would take credit for it, right? That's the, the uh, Ephesians chapter 2 at verses 8 to 10. It is not of works, lest we would boast. We would take credit for it. It's the gift of God. That's very simple. It's very easy to prove through the scripture. But right here, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, then he will keep my word. And here's what will happen in reply to that. And my father will love him, and we will come to him. We will make our home with him. Now, this word right here, home, We've already studied that word one time in this chapter alone, and it's the only two times that it's found anywhere in the New Testament, where Jesus says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions. Same word, mansions, dwelling places, depending on your translation. Same word for home right here. We will make our abode. Now notice, they're going to come to us, but what does it take for that? It is to acknowledge who he is, to establish that relationship with him, to keep his words to be people who are disciples or, or people who have come to that relationship with him. So what happens in turn? Myself and my father, we will indwell him. We will make you our dwelling place. Now how wild is that? We may believe that, we may actually say it, but ponder that for a moment. To the believer, which again makes this belief in what the Bible says about the nature of God unique in all of the religions of the world. That because of an event, that being the acknowledgement of sin and being forgiven for it, as a result of that forgiveness and the cleansing that happens as a result of it, God says, this place is now inhabitable. And he comes and indwells the believer. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. We are indwelt by the the very God himself who has created us. Once again, united as has never been since Eden. When Adam and, in, uh, Adam and Eve fell into sin, there was a separation. Now Jesus is talking about it as a foregone conclusion, though a few steps are still going to have to take place. Remember, he has not yet been arrested. He has not been beaten. He has not been crucified. He has not risen again. And he has not ascended. And he has not sent the Holy Spirit yet. But he speaks of these things as though they're already done, which is wonderful because it shows you who is ultimately in control, right? Within a couple of chapters, it will look like the bad guys are in control. He knows exactly what's coming. And look at all of the promises that are there, though he will have to endure things that we can't even fully grasp. So look at what he says after this. We will make our home with him. Now, he who does not love me. Now that is by contrast, right? That is by contrast. Because it says, he who does love me is verse 23. And he who does not love me is verse 24. Once again, here's an application part to that. When you read these, every person who is hearing this has to come to an understanding, which verse am I in? Am I the 23 person? Or am I the 24 person who knows that I need to be in verse 23? Can I describe it that way? Does that sound weird to you? Sound odd in your hearing? <laughs> Look at what it says. He who does not love me does not keep my words. So I want to make sure we understand this. This is another element. If you love me, you're going to do the things that I have asked of you. Or you can even say it this way. The fact that you do the things that I have said is an evidence that you love me. Now, if you don't do those things, it is an evidence that you don't love me. You may acknowledge me. You may speak about me, you may use my name, you may do all of those things. Think about what God said of the religious types in Isaiah. That their mouths say the right things, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus quotes from that in the Gospels. You can have all of the outward appearances, but the inward is the issue. 
And if the inside is right, the outside shows those things. It is not externalism, it is internal. How will you know whether there is love? There is evidence and there is fruit. So it says, verse 23, Jesus, or verse 24, rather, Jesus says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear, they are not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So I want you to understand a couple of things here. If you are not obedient to me, there is no love that you have for me. And oh, by the way, since the Father is the one who sent me with these words, you don't love him either. Now, he is saying this to 11 people, right? These are the ones who have been with him from the beginning. But let's once again also remember, this whole episode is not covered in the other three Gospels. John writes this about 60 years after Jesus uttered these words. And I am so thankful for John's gospel because he begins to give definition to the idea of being a Christian and what that means that is not only unique to his gospel, but boy, does it really fill in a lot of blanks for us. It's an amazing thing that we are reading here if we fully understand it. So once again, I hope that what you do is in your own time, maybe before you go to sleep tonight, Read through these a few more times. There's just a few verses here. Read through them in some detail. And then examine yourself. Ask the questions of yourself. Where am I in this? How am I doing in these matters? And this isn't that you have the momentary lapse and you goof up and you do this, that, or the other thing on any particular day. What we are talking about is the pattern of life. How is it that you conduct yourself day by day, all throughout the day over an extended period of time. Because we all have our ups and downs. No one is perfect. We get that. This is not here put for us to be in some kind of bondage of always beating ourselves up over the smallest of technicalities. This is about the lifestyle that we have. What do people see over the extended period of time? Do they see the, the evenness of a walk with God because you honor him and love him and are obedient to what he has to say? See, we get caught up in the moment-by-moment -moment thing. What does it look like in the overall? And that's what's being addressed here. There is something that Paul says as we conclude this morning that I'd like to draw our attention to, and it is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I mention it oftentimes, I will quote this, but today I'd like to go ahead and read it. So if we look at this as the evidence, if you will, of a changed life, James in his epistle in chapter 1 deals with this a little bit. He kind of comes to the culmination, if you will, in verse 22, where he talks about being a hearer versus a doer. And his point is that don't be just a hearer, but also be one who does. Now, it, in him, it is an encouragement, but the encouragement of that is to point to the fact that there is something that is different in the ongoing way of things. And how will you know that? Because you won't just be a person who will hear it, but when you leave, you will also do those things. So it's great. I'm glad that you're here on a Sunday morning, and I'm glad when you come for Bible studies and when we get together. That's great. My prayer for you is that our time in the Word is beneficial enough to that it has the changing effect on your life, that when you leave here, you're no different than when you're in the pew that you take what you hear and you apply it into your day-to-day -day life. Now that is the hallmark of a healthy church. Numbers are not a healthy church. Numbers are great, but if those numbers are dedicated to the Word of God and they are taking it outside the doors and living what they profess with their mouths, that's healthy. That's good, regardless of numbers. Here's what Paul says. Verse 14, we're jumping right into the context of it. You can go ahead and read it all for yourself. We're jumping right into the context. Verse 14 tells us, For the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus Christ, it compels us, it drives us, it pushes us on. Because we judge thusly, that if one died for all, then all died. Now this is the point that if we consider ourselves Christians, well, are you still living as you did in the world? Are people able to see an absolute positive difference before and after? That's a great question. What does the world see, or do they, when they look back in time, they look back and say, what a difference from then versus now, and this was the dividing line. It was that event. Jesus became real and a part of their lives, and they began to be obedient to what he taught. 
If they are able to know that that happened at some point in time and what you were before and what you are now are night and day difference, you're on the right track. Because you die to what those things were is what Paul says. Verse 15. And he, speaking of Jesus, he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and then rose again. Therefore, because of that, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Jesus according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. What he's basically saying is that from that time, when it becomes a spiritual matter, we may know about the Jesus who was the historical flesh person, flesh and blood. John, the one who wrote the gospel, says, yeah, we know him, we heard him, we, we touched him, he's a physical person, we know him. But he is also talking to people who did not see him that way, but he is just as real to them. Because spiritually speaking, he's every bit as alive in the life of the believer more so than the disciples while he was still alive because now he indwells the believer. So Paul is able to say, if you died to that old life and you are now new and alive to him in the spiritual sense, we don't even think of the physical stuff anymore. And then here is how he says this. This is what I want to leave you with this morning as you consider Jesus' words in the gospel and what Paul says here. Because honestly, in one verse, you can tell the difference between the believer and the non-believer. Even the person who hears this said will know where they sit. Look at what it says. Verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... Now, let's stop. Positionally is what's being spoken of here, going back to what Jesus said in John. I in the Father, the Father in me, we in you. That's relationship. That is position. So this tells me that if I am in a relationship, if I am positioned or seated with Jesus in Christ, then that person is a new creation. What does that yield? The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have, past tense, become new. Isn't that cool play on English words there? Has, past tense, become new. That's right here, right now. That's day by day, walking with Jesus, being changed as a result of him. But it is going to come, not from just saying, I got saved once. I'm going to say, have you been studying what he taught you? Have you been understanding and learning just his words? And let's even extend it past that, because anything that has been done in the scripture after his times... The writings of Paul, the writings of Peter, of James, Jude, John. These are all men who heard him and that have passed along those things that they had learned from him. They are on equal footing because they were his teachings to them who are now taught to us. You have 27 books in the New Testament, all helping us to understand what it is to be a Christian. To think that you could somehow exhaust no matter how many years you have on this world or in this world, that you could come to an end of understanding, you're kidding yourself. Here's one thing that I've learned, and we'll close. The older that I get, I see things in the scripture that I have never seen before. Now, how is that? How is it that I've never seen them before? I think there are a few different reasons for that. First of all, the Spirit is opening your eyes to things that are pertinent to you at that particular time. Even what we've studied this morning, if I was to poll each person, well, what did you see in the text this morning? What spoke to you? What spoke to this person over here is going to be different from that person over there. Because the Lord is dealing with people in a different way, in a different level. And I can definitely tell you this. There were things as a brand new believer my mind couldn't grasp. But as he has grown me and matured me as much as he has... There are things that I'm able to understand and to grasp now that I couldn't before. So don't think that, well, I've read the Bible. Congratulations. Read it again. <laughs> because if I was to poll the people that are next to you that are all with you and everything else, they said, yeah, they've read it a whole bunch of times. When they, when they finally start doing what they're reading, it'll be wonderful. Right? So people start looking at each other. Yeah. <laughs> None of us have this nailed. We will spend the rest of our lives coming to an understanding of what these things mean. In the meantime, be tending your life. Recognize that what you hear, you are to understand and to internalize, and that it had better be shown on the outside. That's what Jesus said right there in, what was it, uh, verse 21? That idea of hearing it, keeping it, doing it, all of those kind of things. You know 
You're the one who's around you more than anyone else. How profound is that? Yeah, I guess so. You know there is that thing between you and the Lord that only you know. And so you are to walk in obedience. Let's stand. And sorry if I got all worked up at the beginning of that. I'm usually so mellow and, you know, even keeled. Did I? Do I hear scoffing out there? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Your word is so amazing. The things that you say to us, though we may read it a hundred times, we will see things that change our minds and our hearts. We can be occupied with so many things, and yet we are supposed to be occupied with your word and then the outworking of what we read and what we hear, that it would show in our lives. Father, I'm asking for each person here who has heard your word this morning, if they're believers, if they're saved, if they're born again, then I ask, Lord, that you would encourage them to do the, it is the difficult thing, to deny our own flesh and to walk in accordance with your desires for us. You haven't made yourself unknown to us. You've told us volumes of what you expect of us. I do also pray for those who are in here today, as they would be able to look at verse 23 and then 24. Is there a love that we have for you and is it shown in our obedience to you? Or do we pay lip service to it? But there's no fruit, there's no life, there's no nothing, there's no love. We ask, Lord, that that challenge would go forth to every person, that by the end of the day we could know where we are, have complete understanding and, and complete fellowship with you. We thank you, we give you praise and honor for your word. Be glorified, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen? God bless you.